This is Keys to the Shop, episode 404, Education, Home Brewing, and Starting Your Own Roastery with Kyle Rossell of September Coffee. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFirio. I am your host for the show. Thanks very much for being a part of of this journey as we uh, continue to produce great content to help you run an amazing coffee shop and lead your people well and generally just honor all the work that has gone on before we get the coffee in our stores. It's up to us to run great operations, to uh, lead well, to make great coffee and do so consistently. And really that's at the heart of Keys to the Shop. So I'm glad that you're here. Now I would really encourage you to go ahead and subscribe to the show, share these episodes with a friend or with your team, and make sure that you also, if you love what Keys to the Shop does, leave a five-star rating or review over on Apple Podcasts or over on Spotify. This really helps the show gain traction, helps make people aware of Keys to the Shop. Thanks everybody so much for doing so. And I would also encourage you to go to keystotheshop.com because there's a lot of episodes you can search just by using the search bar in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, So you can topically navigate all of the episodes that have come out in the last uh, six and a half years or so. So now Keys to the Shop is not just a podcast, but also I offer consulting and coaching. Keys to the Shop Consulting is where I get to work one-on-one with you as a coffee shop owner or a soon-to-be coffee shop owner to help you gain clarity, to help you find peace of mind and lay great foundations, solve problems, and avoid needless mistakes along the path. I would encourage you to reach out chris at keys to the shop.com. I would love to talk with you about what you're experiencing right now in your coffee business and how keys to the shop consulting can help. We can set up a free discovery call to do just that. Again, that email for keys to the shop consulting, chris at keys to the shop.com. One of the best ways we can make a great impression on people is by taking something that they've become pretty familiar with, uh, like coffee and making it a little bit better. And sometimes if we can make it a lot better, it's even better, of course. And one of the most exciting tools that has come out to help us do that is the Ground Control Cyclops Brewer from Voga Coffee. The Ground Control Brewer uses SCA award-winning technology to give you the ability to extract incredible depth and range of flavors with such precision. It's truly like getting to know your coffee for the first time and your customers are really going to take notice. Not only is this amazing brewer capable of making mind-blowing batch brew coffee, but the technology allows you to be able to make tea, batched iced lattes, batched cold brew. So you introduce more profitability, more efficiency, and it looks amazing too. So I would encourage you go to groundcontrol.coffee to learn more. Right now they are running a very limited special 50% off the Ground Control Brewer while supplies last. You really need to get in on that. If you've been hearing me talk about the Ground Control and you've been on the fence uh, this is definitely your sign to you know, reach out and get the ball rolling on that. Again, for more information on the Ground Control Brewer and what it's doing to change coffee lives all over the world, go and visit them over at groundcontrol.coffee. You know, speaking of impressions, you know, the impression that people have of plant-based beverages is that they need to sacrifice something in order to maintain their habit with their latte or their mocha cappuccino. And that's just not the case when you're using something like the Barista Series from Pacific because it has been designed meticulously for baristas and tested by baristas around the world before anything has been just made available to the public. And this is the reason why it actually performs. It's called a performance beverage for a reason. It stands up to the heat from the steaming process, achieves amazing texture, and keeps the balance of the beverage focused on the coffee itself. Your customers are really going to love this. Go check them out at pacificfoodservice.com to get samples for yourself and try it and see what you think. I I really do think you're going to be impressed and so will your customers. Again, if you're looking for the best plant-based beverages to truly wow your customers, I think you should be using the Barista Series from Pacific. Okay, everybody. Well, I'm excited to introduce our guest today for Keys to the Shop as we talk about home brewing, starting a roastery. Uh, Really, we talk about the prosumer and professional worlds of coffee and how they overlap. 
Today we're talking with TikTok and YouTube coffee brewing educator and new coffee roastery owner at September Coffee, Kyle Rossell. For many years now, Kyle has been inviting the people who subscribe to him on YouTube and TikTok on a journey of discovery and curiosity around coffee brewing, coffee tasting, and all of the gear that goes along with great espresso and pour overs and how to really achieve an amazing coffee experience at home. Kyle is so well-spoken, energetic, and has a really positive energy that has led to his great success on these platforms as an educator in coffee. And most recently, Kyle, along with his wife, have launched September Coffee, which features an amazing selection of coffees that Kyle is very passionate about. And in today's conversation, Kyle and I talk about his journey into the coffee industry and into coffee education and turning his passion into a platform and then turning that platform into a business and how this has changed his perspective on coffee, how he perceives his role in shaping people's opinions and equipping them with information on coffee. What's the journey been like starting this roastery and how does it differ from the journey of building this platform? Kyle and I will also dive deep into the evolution of how consumers view coffee at home, the impact that prosumers and home brewers make on green coffee purchasing and the cafe industry in general and what Kyle would like cafes to really keep in mind as it relates to this segment of the consumer market that's so passionate, just like him, about coffee. So here now, without further ado, is my conversation with Kyle Rossell of September Coffee. Well, hey, Kyle, welcome to Keys to the Shop. How are you today? Doing well, Chris. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm always a fan of your videos and the spirit that you bring to a community of coffee and helping people discover coffee and coffee equipment and just equipping people. You know, this is dear to my heart, obviously, with a podcast that like talks about, you know, things from, you know, the coffee shop perspective, like the resourcing and equipping of people is really important. This has been a pretty engaged project with you. I mean, it's it's not an easy thing to run a YouTube channel. At first, it sounds like, oh, a YouTube channel, but it's it's kind of a job, huh? It is. And it's our my full time job uh, as of last year. <laughs> but thank you, Chris. I'm, I'm stoked to be here. I'm a huge fan of the podcast. I've been listening for many years, years before I believe I even started my YouTube channel. So very, very excited to be here. Well, I want to start by, you know, saying, okay, three years now you've been doing your YouTube channel. And then before that, though, you know, nobody just wakes up out of, you know, mid career in something else and says, I'm going to start a YouTube channel all about coffee, or maybe they do. And so I'm not familiar with how you got to where you are. So maybe fill us in on a bit of that story. Yeah. Many days I wake up and, and wonder the same question. <laughs> <laughs> It's been a long journey and, you know, coffee has been a long time passion of mine and I have an obsessive personality. So I remember the first time I went to a cafe back, you know, about a decade ago, especially coffee cafe. And my friend took me and he wanted to show me something different. And I remember sitting down in a barista making me a Chemex. This was in, in Ottawa, the city that I live in. And it was an incredible experience. I had never seen anything like it at that point. I had never heard of specialty coffee. And it was one of those moments where it was like a light bulb aha, where it was like, this is very cool. I want to learn more about it. I wouldn't say I was obsessed at that point, but I wanted to know as much as I could about this craft and being somebody who obsesses over things and has that obsessive, per obsessive personality rather, I went down a rabbit hole. And at the time that would be like home barista forums. And I started visiting as many coffee shops as possible, learning from as many people as possible until I knew as much as I could. <laughs> and that led me down this rabbit hole of just wanting to learn more. And then a few years ago, COVID hit, and I decided that I would share the passions that I have for coffee and the vast knowledge that I had received and, and grown over the past you know, number of years and share that with people because it seemed like a lot of people wanted to learn how to brew coffee at home. And so I started a blog right before the pandemic actually called Brew at Home. And I was posting photos on, on Instagram and I was making blog posts about how to brew coffee, how to make better espresso. And at the time, there wasn't a ton of content creators out there like there is today. And I was just sharing the knowledge I had to help people brew coffee at home. I was not trying to be a content creator or do anything like that. It was just simply sharing my knowledge like many people had done. At the time, blogging was a little more common than it is today. And so I did that. 
And that became more of like a social media presence. And eventually I realized the organic transition would be, okay, well, let me take this to YouTube. I feel like there's not a ton of people at the time who were doing it, maybe a handful. And I felt like I had the abilities and I wanted to learn more about videography. And so I had no idea about anything related to videography at the time. I learned it all to start a YouTube channel about coffee. Fast forward, uh, here we are. Yeah, you're and you're recording this in your studio, which years ago, you probably would have maybe balked at the idea that you would have had a full fledged soundproof coffee studio. But here you are. Here we are. And <laughs> my wife and I laugh about it all the time. I am in my studio right now recording. And this is a space that we had that was unfinished. And we decided to build it out early on in my YouTube career and go back to some of my early videos. And I didn't have a studio for a bit of time. But shortly after I built it out because we needed a space, we have two kids under five years old. And again, I just knew that there was potential in this industry. And, and I had such a passion to teach people about brewing better coffee at home, teaching people about the industry origin, obviously gear as well. And and I was like, hey, like I'm, I am all in on this. And obviously... Uh, at the time, YouTube was not my full-time profession. It only recently became such. But I decided that, yeah, I would be spending all my free time, every moment of my free time, making videos, writing scripts, testing products so that I could help people in their pursuit. You know, you come into this industry with a perception of what it's like. And the rabbit hole leads you to more discoveries, which obviously didn't dissuade you. It only gave you more energy for it. But I'm curious about you know, entering into a new industry and from where you were, which, you know, I imagine was maybe suited to your personality or not. I don't know. But how did you find yourself evolving your perspective of the industry as you dove into it? And what kind of things from your previous work up until that point did you find were helpful in helping you embrace that kind of perspective? Yeah, one thing I loved about the community and I saw growing very early on to my pursuit in all of this was the sense of community within the specialty coffee community. And I, I absolutely loved that. I, I love seeing people grab a hold of something that they were mutually passionate about and, and finding that, that common ground. My previous work, I actually, for those who aren't aware, I worked at a church and I was actually there for seven years. I was a youth pastor and I helped the teenagers and, and mentor them and, and help teenagers basically off the streets and, and help them give them a desired future and, and, and helped their futures as well. And so I, I was big and passionate about community as it was. And then coming to the uh, specialty coffee community, it was incredibly refreshing to see that again. And I quickly grabbed a hold of that. And today I know I have a, a discord where we have people who are, are posting things about coffee every single day, what they're brewing, sharing different recipes, helping newbies, if you will, in specialty coffee, if we can use that term, to learn how to brew coffee, sharing recipes. And I think, I don't know if you would agree, Chris, but the, the community we have within this this group of specialty coffee is beautiful. You know, SCA is coming up in a few months and I'm excited. I'm excited to be able to see people that I've only seen online, but the community online has been incredibly wonderful, beautiful, and, and it's encouraging. Yeah, I love that. And in the past and in now, you're equipping people and there's community. So I love the common thread between those two worlds. And yes, you're right. In in the coffee community, we, we do definitely have a desire to kind of collectively help each other up and that whole rising tide idea uh, floating all ships. And I think one of the things that is true for me that I have seen over the course of a couple of decades of coffee is that there's a lot of different understandings and therefore some hurdles that people who want to brew great coffee at home need to overcome. Now today there's all these tools and pieces of information available. So guides to that world like yourself are very valuable. So I'm curious what you perceive as maybe the number one challenge to consumers today who do have just a very available resources. What's the number one hurdle for them uh, understanding and successfully brewing great coffee at home? Well, that's a great question, Chris. I don't know if I can answer it accurately. I'll give you my opinion. I think there are many different hurdles for sure. Depends on who you ask and, and what their resources are. I don't want to assume that everybody watches my videos and, and I'm sure that not everybody watches some of the bigger channels videos, right? Certain people find resources and, and ways to educate themselves in different manners in different platforms, you know, when it comes to, to watching YouTube videos, there's a lot of content out there on, on recipes and methods and methodology, 
that are very helpful. I think it can become overwhelming. And in a sense, I talk to many people in the community who get confused. Well, this person said this and that person said that. What's the bottom line? And so I definitely think it's it's growing as an industry. We have more content. We have more education. We have more blog posts. We have everything online. And for the most part, we are growing as an industry. But I definitely think there are, there are definitely people who have been maybe oversaturated by opinions. And so opinions can become confusing at times. And so even in my own content, I'm not perfect at this. I've you know, made, made these mistakes many times, but especially recently, I've been very intentional to, while educating people about different things within the industry, to understand that I have my own bias. And within that, sharing that very openly and honestly, not specifically about a bias towards like a company or, or a gear brand per se, but the way I prefer my coffee, the way I like to enjoy my coffee, the way I, I you know, and so that that reality is is important, because coffee is an incredibly subjective experience, what I might like, you might not. And to say this is the best, or this is the only way to do something is very damaging, I think, in the industry, if we're not careful. And so as a content creator, now I realize my platform has grown to the space where I never thought it would. And I have a platform now. And because I have a platform, I have to be careful what I say, because uh, what I say will be seen by uh, tens of thousands of people. And and even if it's just one that I confuse, that that's, you know, for me, very important to recognize. And so I, to answer your question, I think while we grow as an industry and more resources are widely available, I think we just need to be careful that we don't make absolutes in opinions. And so for me, that's something that I'm constantly evaluating my own content and what I share and making sure that what I say is is addressed and shared as my opinion and not necessarily given as absolute or fact. Okay, so there's a lot there. And I really appreciate the sentiment of being careful with your platform and also trying to sort of provide a few got a speed bumps to people's maybe snap judgments because the content is edited so well. It's, it's, it's bright. You've got, you know, neon in the background of your videos. I mean, that's fancy. I, I really want that for, you know, the day I do YouTube. And, but the point <laughs> is, is that I really think, and I think maybe you would agree that we desire personalities to vouch for the thing, the information itself. And so our mind is constantly turning just information into rules or the way it should be. So it's like, cause Kyle says it, like, I think, you know, I'm not going to think too much about it. Cause if Kyle says it's, this, you know, this way, then it's gotta be true. And I think that's what you're saying is like the danger of creating all of this content is that you sort of nurse that you know, give room for that muscle to get stronger when at the same time, it actually might prove detrimental to somebody truly progressing in their ability to, to make great coffee. I agree. And don't hear me wrong. I think it's important to have opinions. I think people want to hear them. I think that's why platforms like mine exist and other creators as well. Like people do want to know what we, we think of things when it comes down to reviews or, or preferences. But I think it's very important for myself to just tread lightly and understand that my opinion is not the only opinion out there and somebody might disagree and that's okay. And that's what, you know, coffee in many ways is, is, has grown to what it is because of, right. You know, the way that we've even progressed in methodology to brew espresso has, has changed drastically over the past few years. And so, you know, 10 years ago, we would, we would say the way we brew espresso today was wrong. And so I think it's very important for us today to not make absolutes to say this is the best or, or at least for myself, because that could change in a few years. <laughs> and, and platforms like YouTube exist, well, at least for now, for a long time, if not forever. And so a video from 10 years ago can still populate. And, and I just don't want somebody to pull up my content one day. Again, I've made these mistakes and I want to continue to get better and say, well, Kyle, you said this when my opinion has changed. So again, we're human and that'll happen. There's nothing I can really do about that. I got to create the content that I can. But to answer your question in terms of what's the biggest detriment, I think it's it's people getting confused that, oh, well, Kyle said this is the best, therefore this is the best. And I've really tried to foster my content and, and community to ensure that I can share something, but I could be wrong as well. Okay, so when it comes to content that you've created over the years, what have you found has helped people the most? I mean, it could be that the video is watched the most, but that might not necessarily elicit as many responses that 
give you that tangible feedback to say, this changed my life, quote unquote. <laughs> so what has been maybe the, the number one thing that people have said, this, this changed everything for me? That's a very good question. There's definitely different avenues and facets within my content. Recipes and methodology are one, but also reviews are another as well. And, and then I also have the personal side of things where I haven't done as much lately. We are working on some other kind of content where it was more like vlog styles and more behind the curtain of my life. Those ones are very great to foster community, but not necessarily gain as much traction for views. And so not that that's what I do this for, but recipes and, and reviews definitely get more traction on the YouTube algorithm, which is a whole part of this, which we can chat about. But <laughs> You know, with uh, with that, I think the biggest ones have been when it comes down to like budget reviews. One of my earliest videos that did very well is I took I think ten hand grinders that were under one hundred and fifty dollars, and at the time, no nobody had a video on this, and I posted a video, and it was one of my first videos that went semi viral, and a lot of people were were blown away that the industry has come to a place where you could have a piece of gear that produces really good quality coffee that's not a thousand dollars, because again, even ten years ago coffee grinders were made by very few manufacturers and the good ones were very pricey. And then today we fast forward to an industry that is very saturated when it comes to different options that were are available to us both in the industry, but also as a home brewer. And because it's saturated, there's, there's more competition and the prices have been more competitive. I think that was one that was really encouraging for me to see is, is just uh, pulling apart all these different items um, and showing people like, hey, like you want to brew great coffee at home. And again, this was early on into the pandemic as well. So people were trying to brew great coffee. And, and we definitely saw an influx of people in the specialty, I believe, in that time. You know, a, a cheap hand grinder was was something that I was really excited to share. And and a lot of people claim cling to that one. And, and there's other videos too, for sure, in terms of methodology and different uh, recipes that I've either created or shared. But that one definitely stood out to me as one of my early successes in this industry as a, as a creator and educator. Uh, was just like, hey, this is this is this exists. You didn't realize it, but here are ten options available to you today. I love that this basically insinuates that people are very cognizant of the cost of entry into good coffee. That's it's interesting to me because there are a lot of budget options out there. But what we do in, in the industry aesthetically is seems like as we communicate something that inadvertently creates barriers for people that they, if you have to ask, you can't afford it, basically, mm -hmm. kind of mentality. What do you think about that? I dislike it very much. <laughs> I, I really don't know what else to say there. I think uh, I understand it. I understand it to a certain degree. I find myself on the precipice of, of being a pro, but also a enthusiast. And I am on the discords, I am on Reddit, I am on forums. <laughs> Currently, you know, I probably shouldn't be because those are very toxic places at times. But I do find myself there to continue to stay relevant and current and understand what the community is saying. And I see a lot of those attributes and in, in realities where I think it's changing. I think it's changing a lot in the past year, especially where that culture is not fostered. But there was definitely a time I find myself on a, on a barista forum, where it was if you if you do have to ask, then this is the wrong hobby for you, which it's just not the case. I mean, the industry itself wasn't fostered upon the idea of more expensive gear, right? Specialty coffee in itself is all about the crop. That's that's where it starts. You know, sure, gear is a big part of it, but the farmer is a much bigger part of it. And that didn't, you know, wasn't fostered because we wanted to buy more expensive things, right? And so I think at the very core of it, I love this idea that things are getting more affordable. I think many people do. I'm very passionate about it. I, I want to continue to see a specialty become as affordable as possible. At the same time, we're also seeing on the flip, uh, gear getting cheaper, but coffee getting more expensive. And as a coffee roaster, I'm seeing that very firsthand now. But, you know, I think that's okay. I think we're, we're, we haven't been paying enough for coffee over the years. And so if gear gets cheaper, we can then revert that money to specialty coffee. I don't think it's overpriced, but I definitely think we're seeing that shift and i've said many times like if you can spend you know as minimal as possible on gear and spend that money on great product like coffee instead you will have much better results than spending a lot of money on gear and very little on coffee yeah, that's a great point and the idea of having options of different gear that can best accomplish your taste you're talking about like your opinion being sort of a hurdle but your opinion is much like choosing a pour over device is an option that may or may not be right for you, depending on what you're brewing. Everyone's got different tastes and somebody might like those really 
floral and bright coffees or more developed coffees. And the proliferation of options that we have out there means, I suppose, that just like you're saying, the gear gets a little bit more ubiquitous and easy to get, but then you have the coffees that are available out there at the same time becoming more available at a greater range of different flavors. So now today there's a lot more developed coffees on the market. There's more blends because we've kind of gone back on the third wave into a, a little bit more balance. So it feels like with all the options gaining in volume that also the options for different kinds of coffees for different kinds of tastes is, is also growing. Is that a coincidence or is, or is that like one affecting the other, do you think? I don't think it's a coincidence at all. I think the market's obviously growing. The industry's growing. We have a larger customer base than we ever have. I think it's very obvious, you know, at one point we didn't have the home barista community that we have now. And I think it's a very important community. As a pro, I never want to kind of distinguish or I start. Let me go back on that, Chris. As a pro, I, I never want to neglect the importance of the home barista community. I think they're the ones that really push our our industry forward in many ways, not the only way, but in a big way for sure. And because of that, I think we're able to offer a wide variety of coffees at different prices than we ever were before. I don't think a cafe, many cafes would buy, you know, a beautiful wash cedra at, you know, $200 a kilogram, but many home baristas will. And so we're seeing that variety grow because of our consumer base and, and it's growing. And I think it won't stop. I, I definitely think it's exciting, you know, not only for gear, but for coffees and producers and what they're able to produce and what they're able to get paid to be able to, to do it in a sustainable way. I'm excited about it. I get very, very passionate about this topic, but no, I don't think it's a coincidence at all. So it's interesting that you're talking about how, you know, this large scale purchase of coffee at a high price might not happen at a cafe, but at a small amount, a, a consumer would purchase like a bag or, or, you know, 12, a couple 12 ounce bags of that Cedra, for example, that you just mentioned in the industry, we, we love the idea that we would have somebody purchasing that coffee over and over and over again. That repetition of purchase allows the roaster to continue buying the green, which the farmer loves because they know they can count on that purchase. And the small amounts of coffee purchased by the home consumer doesn't seem like it would have an impact on that kind of sustainable demand that a farmer would count on unless they were buying subscription services or always buying that seed or always buying from one roaster. So that it kind of makes me want to ask like, are consumers more likely to just always go with variety and small quantities or did they get loyal to one brand they like and purchase a lot of it all the time? Or is it just a mix? Like, is one favored over the other? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not sure I have the answer, Chris. I definitely think it depends on the consumer and it depends on the region. You know, here in Canada, we have some fantastic grocers. You know, Canada is a wonderful space for the specialty coffee community. I'm incredibly passionate about it. And I would say as Canadians, uh, I'm very loyal to Canadian roasters. There's a lot of them, but there's a lot doing very well. And I tend to buy a lot of my coffee from the same roasters over and over. And for me, I have access to, you know, a lot of different coffees and and so do many people. But I think there is definitely a loyalty for sure. I definitely think, you know, from my experience and others may differ, I think there is a loyalty to certain brands and certain roasters. And I think roasters have a loyalty to certain producers and farmers as well. Again, from what I've seen, as long as their crop uh, upholds to the quality standards that they have, I definitely think it's sustainable. And I definitely think, you know, to answer your question, when it comes down to the home barista buying small quantities, again, I think there's a large, there's a large market that is growing within the home barista community. For example, September Coffee, right now we're growing in terms of our, our wholesale, but right now primarily we're selling retail. And we have a large enough customer base to be able to sustain as a business. And you know, a lot of that audience has come over from platforms like my YouTube channel or or people interested in in our coffee from what I've shared. But we as an industry or we as a business rather are sustainable right now just from home baristas alone. And so I definitely think it's it's growing. I think it's a growing market share. 
That being said, obviously, wholesale and doing large quantities of coffee for the cafe will always be an important important aspect to the business, and that will never stop. I just think that there is a growing market share for the home barista to buy special coffees and to buy traditional coffees as well. But, you know, I gave that example of the Cedra. I definitely think there will be cafes who purchase that as well, depending on the cafe as a unique tasting experience. And I think they should, especially to educate so many people who come in the cafe. And that's that's happening, obviously, right now. And that will continue to grow. And that's exciting. But I think, yeah, this this industry of, of home brewers buying coffee, it's very cool to see that growing. You can find yourself on different places online of people sharing coffees that they're purchasing. I was on one yesterday on a Discord and, and people were spending $300 for, I think it was a six ounce box of coffee. That's, you know, I wouldn't even dream of that five years ago. <laughs> so it's, right, it's right. I'm not necessarily saying that's the, the way everybody should spend their coffee. I'm just saying that that exists. And that's very cool because what can happen is, you know, these producers, that's not a big lot of coffee by any means. They're able to produce that coffee and charge that amount because certain roasters are able to sell that to the enthusiasts, which is very exciting. Yeah, a hundred percent. And, you know, really, if you're a roaster and you're selling your roasted coffee in the cafe, I mean, you're trying to get people to brew it at home and technically they are home brewers. I mean, I think there's like a secretive kind of, not a secretive, I think there's like an unspoken difference that is like tonal in nature where it's like, there's like home baristas or like home people, people are at home making coffee. And then there's like, home baristas Hmm. that are just on these discords like they might be purchasing equal numbers of bags of coffee because everybody's addicted to the the caffeine but you know they're just doing it in a maybe a more enthusiastic way so it's like technically i guess anybody that we're trying to equip to be successful with our coffee at home is in that category of home brewer whether they become super nerdy about it or not may not even be relevant Absolutely. 100%. And you're going to always see that, right? You know, even in our own business model, just to kind of give you this as an example, at September, we have two different series of coffees right now, and we have a third on the way, but it's not yet uh, released. But within that, it's called our shower series and our storm series. And shower series is coffees that we're highlighting those those coffees that are, are typically lighter developed, you know, lighter roasts that have sparkling acidity and beautiful juiciness to the coffees with great sweetness. But then our storm series, uh, we have coffees that are slightly more developed, coffees that benefit from that with more sweetness, but more solubility and coffees that are a little more approachable that that the traditional home brewer can can have. It's a coffee that I'd purchase my, my parents and they would notice it being very different from their traditional experiences, but it's very much specialty coffee and yet it's approachable. And so I think those those markets will always exist. And that's not what I'm saying by any means, but I definitely think that balance exists. And and I think, again, I'm excited to see where this industry is going. And I think a large part of that is this growing market share within the home barista, no matter how passionate or nerdy, (laughs) to use your words, they are, it exists and it's it's growing. And, And I'm very excited about it. Let me ask you, now that you're talking about September, and this is something that you've just launched as a, now you are a professional coffee person. I mean, you're no longer in the enthusiast category. It's like technically there's no badge that's being mailed to you that you can say like, I got the badge, I'm professional, but you're, this is your business, right? And taking on roasting after having been so deep into the consumer education scene and curating content seems intimidating to me. You mentioned the series that you're offering approachable coffees, coffees that are a little bit more on the the bright and juicy side, etc. So it's a unique track to take because a lot of people at coffee bars right now, they started a coffee shop, then they started roasting, and now they're really trying to understand the consumer and they might be educating themselves according to some of the things that you put out saying, that's a good idea. We should do that for our consumers and put out a video about grinders and all that stuff. But, but now that you've started this roastery and you already have that experience, how does that translate into the decisions that you make regarding your roasted coffee, who you're selling it to and the, the quality that you're putting out? This is a question I love, Chris, and thank you for asking it. Yeah, we're very excited about September. And for those who aren't aware, we launched this company in December of 2022. We launched a Kickstarter, which is a very unique approach for a coffee roastery and coffee business in general. We did this obviously because of the platforms that we had, but a big reason why, Chris, was because we we had investors that were interested. And starting a coffee business, a cafe, a coffee roastery, it takes a lot of capital. And we didn't have that. 
and we just didn't have that available to us without investors. We had a lot of investors interested in in September and investing in this business. We decided that it wasn't the approach we wanted to take at this time because we wanted to ensure the reasons we made decisions for this company and the, the path that we took with September was our own. We definitely felt early on in this journey that investors would have a bit of a pressure, at least the ones that we were dealing with, to change things in the way that we organically wanted to grow them. With September, we have this unique opportunity now because the Kickstarter was incredibly successful and we're incredibly grateful for that. We've been able to launch this business and essentially our, our vision, our, our, our vision statement is we are roasting coffees that we love. And that's really the deciding factor in everything that we do from buying green to how we roast coffees. It's how we'd want to brew them. It's not to appease a cafe or it's not to appease, you know, a certain investor to ensure that we can grow our our business as, as fast as possible. Although obviously that's always the goal in a sense. We, we want to just stay true to our core values and that is just sharing beautiful coffees that we're really incredibly excited to share. And part of that is, like I said earlier, understanding that there's different customers within specialty coffee and, and we have this storm series and shower series to reflect that. You know, our shower series are coffees that I love dearly. The storm series are coffees that my wife loves dearly. We kind of reflect that in the coffees that we roast. And so the coffees that we buy were, you know, we currently just purchased a, a beautiful, like I mentioned earlier, a wash cedra that, that's more on the pricey side. And as a new business, that's probably not the right decision to make in many ways or, or the smart business decision. But for us, it is because we actually just want to share coffees that we're really excited about. This isn't new by any means, and other people have done it before. And we're definitely not claiming to reinvent the wheel by any means. But the core reason we started this business was to continue just to add to the conversation, but also to create something tangible. Because as a content creator and somebody who's been educating many people in many different ways over the past few years, through blogs, through uh, social media, through YouTube, whatnot, I wanted to not just speak it, but I wanted to walk it. And a lot of my content, especially early on, was talking about how coffee is so much more than caffeine, so much more than just a drug that we, we drink every morning, so much more than just a pick-me-up. It's a beautiful industry with incredible roots, and we need to highlight that a little more often. And I find myself, even as somebody who creates content, and going back to that algorithm conversation, I have to definitely appease um, my audience, but also the algorithm in many ways. And I'm trying to balance that, you know, as somebody who creates content and, and reviews gear, I am a gearhead and I love coffee gear. I always have and I always will, but there's definitely a side of consumerism to that. And I want to ensure that my legacy in this industry, uh, who I am as a person is more than just feeding into consumerism and buying the newest tech product. A large part of starting September was that, was how can we give a tangible product? How can we support farmers and producers? How can we continue to do what we respect so many in this industry industry we're doing already and how can we continue to add to that conversation so that's why we started september we're really excited with the journey so far we launched our web store this past week actually and the response has been just absolutely incredible and we're just so grateful for all of that but to answer your question yeah the, the way that we purchase is is our own you know it's we want to buy coffees that on the cupping table stand out to us they might not be everybody's favorite. There might be professionals who would say that's not the coffee they would buy. But for us, it's like, no, that's that's the coffee that, for us that we would enjoy drinking every morning or every afternoon. And for that reason, we purchase it. I'm interested in the comment about I totally respect autonomy and going about this in a way where you can highlight the things that you love. And like you mentioned, you know, the even the content that you share, this is, you know, Kyle's opinion. This is your, you know channel and that's what people tune in for and you know ostensibly this is why they would buy your coffee too and they would say I, we want to drink what kyle thinks is great now i'm curious about the idea of investment and i feel like it wouldn't be anything different than other investors in other uh, countries uh, would want but what is it that you think would change or an investor would want to change that you would be going against what you're doing now. Is it more like the consumer oriented uh, convenience route or your know, darker roasted coffees that are not really what you want? Like, what are the things that you're thinking? Like, this is not what we want in the future. So we're not going to go with it in the present. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and let me clarify too, Chris, like many businesses go that route and it's definitely not a wrong route. It just wasn't the right decision for us. You know, for us, the investors that were interested definitely had large opinions in terms of the coffee that we did buy, the quality of coffee that we bought would have been sacrificed. What we paid per pound or kilogram, that would have been affected for sure. 
And for us, we want to ensure that when we're buying coffee, we're buying it from either directly from farmers and paying them above what we we think that they just deserve as bottom line, but like that they can actually live a sustainable, have a sustainable income. We're buying from importers that we respect and, and live within our ethics. That's very important for us. And so it could have just been our experience. And again, this is not a wrong decision for anybody, but for us early on, we decided that we didn't want those external pressures, that we just wanted to have a very organic, small business for now. That is just a few people roasting delicious coffees. You know, that takes a lot more work in many aspects of being a small business because there's less people to make things happen. And there's a lot more pressure on on, on a few people, but we, we definitely are excited to, to have that as a reality because yeah, we our business is our own. We don't have any other decision makers except for us. And so <laughs> that also means if we make mistakes along the way, they're 100% on us too. But <laughs> we're excited about that ability. And, and we also realize it's a privileged place to be because of the platforms, you know, we've worked so hard to grow that I've worked so hard to grow over the years. People, you know, are, are interested in September and, and, and I'm forever grateful for that for sure. But yeah, we're, we're excited to be able to do that in a very organic way where our business is just 100% us. And it's not reflecting anything else. And at the end of the day, it, it might not be the best business decision. Our bottom line might not be as great as other businesses because of the decisions we make. But for us, it's all about just sharing coffees that we love and, and hoping along the journey, people will really love them too. Now, you know, one of the things that I want to know about here is your opinion, because you've got lots of opinions on brewing gear and you know the coffees you love etc now you had started your journey in coffee going to coffee shops similar to a lot of us right now you go to coffee shops i'm sure your perspective towards shops and what they're offering has changed yeah, speaking for myself i think that we're in an era where home baristas can do a much better job with the coffee sold on the shelves of cafes than cafes can during the rush it's just the way it is a lot of times but I'm, I'm curious how you would advise coffee shops or maybe how you would like to see the cafe that showcases these coffees that home baristas and enthusiasts are buying and brewing at home. How would you advise them to approach consumers about their own coffees? And maybe there's some things we're not doing that we should be doing that you'd love to see these larger roasteries take advantage of, uh, you know, platforms or, or approaches, what would those things be for you? Definitely put me on the spot here with that one. I think the, the roasteries and the, and, and businesses themselves know what's best for them for their own business. I, I definitely don't want to be the person to come and say, Hey, anybody should do this. For me, like I said, you know, with September, we've designed our business in the way that we want it to exist. And so any of these other businesses know what's best for their business. They know their people best. And if you don't feel you do, let me just encourage you that that you do. <laughs> you know what your customer needs. But in terms of what you, you just said, in terms of people, the home brewer being able to brew better coffee, maybe. I think a lot of home brewers are very passionate and have the time. The barista doesn't have the time to pull, you know, 14 shots in the morning <laughs> to dial it in, right? For one customer. They just don't have that. But there are many beautiful tasting experiences I've had at cafes. You can think of beautiful cafes, especially in certain areas of the U.S. where they take that time with customers and their curated experiences, especially when the bar's not busy. And so I don't, really don't want to say a cafe should do this or a roastery should do that. Every business knows their clientele the best. And for me, I definitely don't want to come across saying that I, I would know more. But I would definitely encourage anybody listening saying like this, don't forget about the home brewer you are definitely curating experiences for the cafe and, and those experiences, which are very important. But I've also seen incredible cafes that are also roasteries or roasteries themselves focus and lean in on the home brewer and the home barista. And I think they've seen incredible success from what I've witnessed. And that's encouraging. And so I think they work in tandem. I think the industry is growing in a way where they're not separating the two because I definitely saw that for a long time. And as a consumer, I felt that for a long time where if you didn't do this, then you weren't welcomed in or, or not a part of this community. But I definitely think that's changing. But yeah, I would say to anybody who's maybe you're a roaster or a cafe owner, consider ways that you can really incorporate the home brewer. And I think now that we're out of this, this world of COVID and the pandemic, uh, to a certain extent, I think having public companies are, are very helpful and, and opening them up to beyond just the industry folk. I think that would have been something that I would have loved to see more in my early days of being welcomed into that community. And, and we're seeing that. We're definitely seeing that. I see 
posts on online all the time of of pros alongside home enthusiasts and that group is growing but i definitely think that that would be a curated experience i think many cafes can offer it's easy and there could be so many more opportunities for that as well I appreciate that the breaking down of the barriers, even just perceived barriers to have this mindset that is a cafe. I mean, the, the cafes can be intimidating spaces. I mean, they're not, they're third places. Yes. After a while you get familiar with it, but you know, the lingo and you got to say this, you got to, you know, Jasmine, if you don't pick up Jasmine, then you, are you are really tasting coffee? You know? Right. So making things approachable so that you can introduce people to that world of coffee. And, I, and personally, I think that to add to what you're saying, you need to tap into the kind of enthusiasm that a lot of, you know, new acolytes to coffee <laughs> in LA that have in order to really sell that because they need to see you as a professional, be enthusiastic about the thing and that you sell. Even though you do it day in and day out, it might be also helpful to note that how can you innovate ways to stay passionate and, and enthusiastic yourself so that you foster the same thing in people who purchase your coffee? Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's we've grown a lot as an industry and, and I've witnessed it firsthand. Pretentiousness used to be a terrible attribute to no, being associated with specialty coffee. And there are cafes that I know that still have that that spirit where we are better than, and and I would say if if I can encourage anybody who's listening to if if you feel like that might be, you know, part of your culture, even not uh, willingly, that's that's something that definitely deters people from getting into this beautiful craft. And I think humility is so important. You know, even for myself, who is now, quote unquote, as you said, a pro, also has a large platform. I'm always trying to learn, Chris, and I just want to be humble and, and learning. And 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 I realize that there are people who are have different experiences than I that have different preferences than I and, and no more than me. And so I think that's very important. And so I think as an industry, we can always just, I think humility is, is so important in every aspect, no matter how great you are or how well-known you are. Having humility in this industry will continue to make us better. And that's very important for the specialty coffee community and industry. Nice. I totally agree. Kyle, Wonderful to talk with you, and I love your thoughts and what you're doing with coffee and your content. Thank you for spending time here today. How can we learn more about September and then also tune in for your content online? Yeah, thanks, Chris. September.coffee is where you can find our coffee. Again, we just launched our web store this past week, and, and we've been very excited about that. A lot of work has gone into that, so check us out there. And then on YouTube, just search my name, Kyle Rosell, R-O-W-S-E-L-L, -L, and uh, you can find all of my content there. Kyle, again, wonderful to talk with you, and keep up the great work. Thank you, Chris. Okay, everybody. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that conversation with Kyle. And as he said, I think it's a really great idea for those of you in the coffee roasting business to really embrace in purposeful ways the home brewer. These are your most passionate consumers of your coffee. If the proliferation of Kyle's platform uh, and other platforms are any indication of what the future holds, I think we're just going to continue to see consumers being wiser, more informed, equipped, and passionate. And we need to meet them where they are. We always talk about meeting customers where they are. And oftentimes that means kind of lowering the bar in a sense. And, you know, in our mind, it means, hey, you know, let's meet where customers where they are. They're not quite you know, to this, you know, place of passion as we are. But in many cases, the people who are brewing at home are very well educated and, and actually very skilled. And dare I say, we can learn a lot from them. And so I'm grateful for people like Kyle who put their heart and soul out onto the internet and help equip people to find so much joy in coffee. So a huge thank you to Kyle for joining us on the show. Uh, speaking of joy in coffee, if you want to experience the coffees that Kyle loves, go to september.coffee and uh, sign up for a subscription, buy coffee from that website. And you can find Kyle on YouTube and on TikTok, just Kyle Rossell on those platforms. Follow along on Instagram as well, kyle.rossell. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback for me about today's episode or any other episode of Keys to the Shop, go ahead and email me, chris at keys to the shop.com. 
That's also where you can reach out if you want to set up a free 30 minute discovery call with me to, to talk about working one on one with keys to the shop consulting to help coach you one on one to the next level in your operations, people and quality. Again, that's Chris at keys to the shop dot com. Now coming up really soon is Coffee Fest. And I say soon, it's coming up in the beginning of June. For me, this is in Louisville, Kentucky at the next show. That's my hometown. So I'm really excited. It, it feels kind of weird. <laughs> you know, I always travel to these shows. I've been going to Coffee Fest for uh, 20 years, pretty much, um, actually, since 2003. So it's been 20 years. I have been going as a competitor, a lecturer, a teacher, and I, and I will tell you, Coffee Fest is one of the best investments you can make in terms of trade shows and events to help educate yourself, to help equip you and your team for success in coffee retail. The free or accessibly priced trainings, workshops, panel discussions, and lectures are worth the price of entry alone, and it is not expensive. I speak about four or five times over the weekend at each show, and so do a bunch of other people that are experts in their field in roasting and leadership, entrepreneurship, barista training, finances, and beyond. So go to coffeefest.com and look at the upcoming shows. I mentioned Louisville, that's coming up in June, but then there's also Anaheim, California, followed by Orlando, Florida. So you can use the code KEYS, K-E-Y-S, to get 50% off your registration. When you go to coffeefest.com, just make sure when you sign yourself and your team up for these shows, use the code K-E-Y-S, KEYS, to get 50% off. And uh, I hope to see you there. So definitely uh, let me know if you're gonna be there. You can send me a DM or you send me an email. Let me know, I'd love to say hello. So again, for more information, go check it out, coffeefest.com. And with that, that is the end of our show, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me. Don't forget to subscribe to the show, share these episodes with your friends, with your team, with your cousins. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.